I really want to talk to you from my heart. So uh, there have been a lot of great sermons preached this week, and uh, um, I, I really want to talk to you about things that are on my heart that are precious to me that I think we need to understand in terms of history and something of the big picture. I don't know if you recognize the name John Huss, H-U-S-S. He is known and he is loved by anybody who knows anything about Reformation history. He was from Bohemia, which today would be Croatia. He was a pre-Reformation reformer. He was born to peasant parents in a village called Hasanek. And you were named after your village. At 20 years of age, he decided he didn't want the whole Hussanek name, so he shortened his name to Hus. Hus means the goose. John the goose. And that nickname stuck. So that 100 years later, after Hus had died, Martin Luther referred to him. And he referred to his martyrdom in this way. The goose was cooked. And that's where that phrase came from. Still around. The day for the cooking of the goose was July 6, 1415. He was taken to the cathedral in Prague. He was dressed fully in his preacher's garments. And then he was stripped of every piece, one by one. And it was down to nothing but undergarments. This was the public illustration of his defrocking, of his excommunication from the church and from the ministry. The council that met that day to defrock him was called the Council of Constance, and it was presided over by the Bishop of Constance. And the bishop of Constance demanded that now nearly naked, he be tied to a stake and doused with oil and burned. He prayed this, Lord Jesus, it is for you that I patiently endure this cruel death. Have mercy on my enemies. I know where he learned that prayer. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Or maybe from Stephen, lay not this sin to their charge. He was heard as the flames consumed his body, singing the Psalms. His executioners were so afraid of what would happen if his charred body remained because he was so loved and so revered by so many people, they were afraid that they would take that body and make some kind of a relic out of it and start a movement. So they scooped up every remaining bit of ashes and threw them in a local lake, dispersed widely. And yet, when the people who loved him and followed him went back to Bohemia, they continued to follow everything that he had taught them. They became known as the United Fraternity. Eventually, they got another name, the Moravian Brethren. And they became one of the earliest and most powerful mission agencies through whom came People like John Wesley. And John Wesley came into England and preached a great revival and even came to America and preached. And we stand in some measure in that tradition. So we trace our spiritual roots even back to John Huss. Martin Luther was a monk a hundred years later. And he was in his library. I've been in that library, Wittenberg. And Luther was rummaging through 
books and volumes in the library, and he found, this is pre-printing press, stacks of sermons handwritten by John Huss. And he began to read them a hundred years later. And this is what Luther wrote. I was overwhelmed with astonishment. I couldn't understand for what cause they had hurt so great a man, listen to this, who explained the scriptures with such gravity and skill. That's what he did. He explained the scriptures. Martin Luther looked to John Huss as his hero. John Huss preached Reformation doctrines a hundred years before the Reformation. Now, why did they execute Huss? This is what I'm getting at. A little biography. He was raised in a very poor family in a very poor village. How are you going to survive? How are you going to get a little bit of money and make it in the world? Answer, become a priest. You become a priest, the church takes care of you, you're set for life. So he became a priest to escape poverty. He was really smart, so he went to school, got a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, and a doctorate. And in 1401, he was ordained to the priesthood. They assigned him to be the preacher at Bethlehem Chapel that seated 3,000 people in the city of Prague. And immediately he broke with tradition and preached in the people's language, not in Latin, which is helpful. (laughs) He came under the influence of another great, great hero of the faith, John Wycliffe, the Englishman who translated the Scripture. And whenever John Huss ascended into the pulpit of Bethlehem Chapel, he explained the Bible. Desiring, his biographer says, to hold, believe, and assert whatever is contained in the Scripture as long as I have breath. Well, this threatened the Roman Catholic system. So... He was forbidden to preach. He was then excommunicated the first time, and he kept preaching anyway. And he kept preaching in Prague, in Bethlehem Chapel. And he leaned more heavily on the Bible than he had before, which he proclaimed was the final authority for all things spiritual. What was the church going to do about him? This is what they did. Anybody who went to hear him preach could not receive Holy Communion. Anybody who went to hear him preach could not be buried with a Christian burial. This was some serious stuff to the people of that day. And so to spare the people the pain of not coming to the Lord's table and not having a Christian burial, he left the church. In 1412, he went to the countryside, and he did in the countryside exactly what he had done at Bethlehem Chapel. Every week, he got up and explained the meaning of the Bible, and he wrote, and he wrote, and he wrote, and he wrote, and everything he wrote, people took into town and read publicly. His most famous treatise is called The Church the church. Here are his radical views, three of them in that document. Number one, he said, the church is made up of all believers. That was his first heresy. Oh, you didn't know that was a heresy? (laughs) Roman Catholic Church teaches the church is made up of cardinals and bishops and nobody else in that day. The only way that people could commune with the church was through the bread. They didn't give them the cup. They were afraid they'd spill it and spill the blood of Christ. So people communed with the church, which was made up of cardinals and bishops and the pope. And the priests were admitted to that. John Huss says the Bible teaches that if you're a believer, you're in the church. 
That was heresy. His second heresy, he said the authority of the Bible is higher than the authority of the church. But here's what got him burned. Listen to this. He said, the Pope is not the head of the church. Jesus is. That's what he said. In fact, he went further than that. He said, Christ alone is the head of the church and not the Pope who through ignorance and love of money is corrupt. And he went further and said, to rebel against the Pope is to obey Christ. To to obey Christ is to rebel against the Pope. The truth of Christ's headship over his church cost him his life. century later, by the way, when Huss died, he said, you may kill this goose, but someday a swan will come. One of his last statements. A hundred years later, the swan arrived, Martin Luther. A hundred years later. And you know what Luther's battle was? Who's the head of the church? Luther said, I'm quoting from Table Talks, I am persuaded that if at this time the Apostle Peter in person should preach all the Holy Scripture and only deny the Pope's headship, they would hang him. Yes, he said, Luther did. If Christ himself was on earth and should claim headship, without a doubt, the Pope would crucify him again. In case you wonder, the Roman Catholic Church still holds to the headship of the Pope. Reading from Catholic Theology... The Pope possesses full and supreme power of jurisdiction over the whole church, not merely in matters of faith and morals, but also in church discipline and the government of the church. If anyone shall say, the Vatican Council declares, if anyone shall say that the Roman Pope has the office merely of inspection and direction and not a full and supreme power of jurisdiction over the universal church, let him be damned. Luther said, I owe the Pope no more allegiance than I owe Antichrist. You need to understand that the doctrine of the headship of Christ in the church has not been preserved and protected except at immense cost. Daubigny, in his History of the Reformation in the 16th Century, writes, quote, Luther's rejection of the Pope as head of the church inflicted the most terrible blow on Rome. Calvin, John Calvin said, Some think us too severe when we call the Roman pontiff Antichrist. John Knox identified the Pope as Antichrist tyrant over the church. In 1555 to 1558, 45 months in England, there was a reign of terror led by Bloody Mary. She slaughtered to the death 283 Protestants. First one was John Rogers. John Rogers finished William Tyndale's work of translation in translating the Scripture. His crime, he would not submit to the headship of the Pope. In fact, all 283 were killed for the same failure to accept the Pope's declaration of transubstantiation in the bread and the cup, that the bread and the cup were the real body and the real blood of Christ. They denied it, and they died for it. Henry VIII came along, the English king, loyal subject to the Pope, until the Pope refused to give him a divorce. Remember that? Oh, because the Pope wouldn't give him a divorce from Catherine to Mary Anne... 
He repudiated the Pope's headship and sovereign authority, made himself head of the church. Henry VIII became the head of the church. He required every household in his kingdom to swear an oath that they believed he, not the Pope, was the head of the church. Those who refused were hanged, drawn, and quartered in that order. You're hanged, you're sliced, and you're cut into chunks for denying that Henry VIII is the head of the church. Hanged, by the way, cut down while still alive, mutilated, beheaded, and chopped into pieces. John Knox confronted Bloody Mary over this, and he got carried away a little bit because in the introduction of what he wanted to say, he identified her as a woman of stout stomach. Uh, You don't want to go there. But she was so afraid of John Knox that she never, he never was martyred because she was just terrified of his power. Charles I, another king, insisted that he should rule the church and ordered himself to wear the title and be acknowledged as head of the church. In 1560, the Scots rebelled. In 1647, the Westminster Confession of Faith was made, and this is what it says. Among other things, there is no other head of the church but the Lord Jesus Christ, nor can the Pope of Rome in any sense be head thereof, but it is the, but is that Antichrist, the man of sin and son of perdition that exalts himself in the church against Christ and all that is called God. And the English tried to force the headship of the king on the Scots. 1637, they sent an emissary up to St. Giles Cathedral in Edinburgh. He brought a new prayer book, which essentially established this headship. He was reading it there, and according to tradition, there was a lady in the audience named Jenny Geddes, who was so infuriated at what he was reading, she picked up her stool and threw it at him. Started a rebellion that Sunday that led to the National Covenant, the Scottish National Covenant, signed by 60,000 Christians to affirm that Christ is the head of the church. And for 50 years, the English killed these Christians from one end of Scotland to the other. They had their church services out on the moors, in the cold, in the wet, and they had to run for their lives. One of them, one of my favorites, is Richard Cameron. And one day, Richard Cameron received a box delivered to his house. He opened the box, and in the box were the hands of his son, both hands. And he writes, he says, they were my own son's hands, my own son's hands. And a day later, he received a box with his head. That was the price for saying that Jesus Christ is the head of the church. For 50 years, the battle raged in Scotland. Charles II led the slaughter, chopping, hacking, beheading, drowning, even children. This kind of persecution over this doctrine forced a crystallization of what the doctrine meant. And that's what happened. William Blakey, writing in 1888, says, By the force of reaction, the church was thrown upon the more full assertion of Christ's claims as head of the church and the glorious privilege of the church to follow her head. Now I come to you and I say, Christ is the head of the church, and you say, sure, we believe that. But that doctrine has sailed down to us on a sea of blood. It has sailed down to us on a sea of blood. What does it mean when you say Christ is the head of the church? What is that telling us? What are we supposed to derive from that? I mean, we live in America. We've never had a king. We've never been subjects of a monarchy. We've never had one-man rule. We don't like that. We go all around the world trying to prevent it and stamp it out. We want to free the world from one-man rule. We have no experience in America of absolute sovereignty, unilateral control. Neither do we understand the idea of a master and a slave. We don't like that either. That also is absolute unilateral sovereign control. So when we talk about the headship of Christ, I'm not sure we really understand what we're talking about here. 
The Bible claims for Christ that he is the head of the church. If you want to borrow another metaphor, he is the sovereign king over the church and he is the master over the church. Essentially, the church is a monarchy and Christ is king. And in his church, he does whatsoever he wills. That's why we go into all the world and teach people to obey everything he has commanded. What is a church? A church is a gathering of people who are in subjection to the all-glorious head, to the all-sovereign king, to the all-powerful master. That's what it means to be a believer. The Bible is crystal clear that Christ is the head of the church. That's an anatomical analogy. No other part of the body gives orders to the body, only the head. The Bible tells us that not only is he the head of the church, but he is the ruler of the church. He is the king of the church, the sovereign of the church. That's a political analogy. And also tells us that he is the master or lord of the church, and that's a social analogy. But all those analogies say one and the same thing. In fact, if you will remember 2 Corinthians chapter 10, you will remember that the Apostle Paul says that uh, we're engaged in a spiritual war and we don't use fleshly weapons, right? Our weapons are not carnal, but but mighty unto God because we're pulling down strongholds. The picture is graphic. This is talking about a war for souls. It it says we are assaulting fortresses. And the Greek word for fortress is fortress, same word for prison, same word for tomb. Because people in their ideological fortresses are captive, so it is a, an ideological fortress that becomes their prison that ends up their tomb. And, and what, are these, what are these massive fortresses that we assault? He says this, we are uh, assaulting fortresses, and then right away he further says this, we are assaulting logismos in the Greek, ideas. They are ideological fortresses that are prisons and tombs. And then he further defines it as this. Every idea raised up against the knowledge of God. Any ungodly idea, any unbiblical idea is a fortification that will damn the person who buys into it. So that what we do in evangelism is a battle for the mind. It is a battle of how how people think. It is a battle to place the truth where there is deception and lies and error. And then he sums it up by saying, with this in view, to bring every thought captive to whom? Christ. Why? Because if you are a believer, you are captive to Christ, and He is in charge of every thought. That is dominance. That is why Jesus said, you want to come after me? If a man wants to come after me, put it this way, let him deny himself. It's over. You are no longer the Lord and Master of your life. You are no longer in charge. Jesus doesn't come alongside to help you fulfill your dreams. He takes over. That's Lordship. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross. That is, you deny yourself to the degree that you may have to give up your life and follow me. Follow me. So how can I bring every thought captive to Christ? How can I submit to the head of the church? Answer, do what he wants. So how do I know what he wants? Because in the language of 1 Corinthians 4.16, here you have the mind of Christ. If you ask me what Christ thinks, I'll tell you what he thinks. Go to the Word of God and tell you what he thinks. He thinks the same way God the Father thinks. He thinks the same way God the Holy Spirit thinks. And all that we need to know about what he wills, what he wishes, what he desires, what he demands is in the pages of Scripture. So if Christ is going to rule in his church, the only way he can rule in his church is if 
the people in his church hear his commands. How are they going to do that? They're not going to get them out of the local newspaper. Where are they going to get them? You have the mind of Christ. Where is it? It's, it's between introduction and concordance. That's where it is. All true Christians must know they are under the authority of Jesus Christ, the head, the sovereign, the Lord, the master of the church. I, I want to digress a little bit because I've been thinking so much about this. If I were to ask you to uh, give me the irreducible minimum, uh, what is the fundamental truth of Christianity? Let me start with an illustration. You, you may have seen the interview that Rick Warren did with John McCain and Barack Obama prior to the election. And he said to, to John McCain, he said, what does your Christianity mean to you? How do you explain your Christianity? To which John McCain replied, it means I'm forgiven. I'm saved. What does that mean? What does that mean? By what? Through whom? How? If somebody asked you in a short answer, what is your Christian faith? How do you articulate your Christian faith? In three words, what would you say? Jesus is what? Lord. That's what I wanted to hear. Everybody claims religion provides salvation. Otherwise, you couldn't sell religion. It doesn't mean anything. I wanted to hear, it means Jesus is Lord. And I've submitted my life to Him in everything. That's what I... I want to hear that even from pulpits. Look. Romans, Romans 10, 9, and 10. If you confess Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart God raised Him from the dead, you shall be saved. That's foundation. Oh, you say, the popular way is Jesus wants to be your personal Savior. That just grinds on me. What do you mean? Like a butler? What is, what is a personal Savior? Like it sounds like he's just going to fit right in and, and you can kind of, you know, shape him. He's just going to be your little personal Savior. That ambiguity fits the, the trendy vagueness of contemporary Christianity. Or you hear people say, you need to have a personal relationship with Jesus. Let me tell you, the devil has a personal relationship with Jesus, and it's not a good one. <laughs> and every sinner in the history of the world has a personal relationship with Jesus, and it's not a good one. What are you talking about? What do you mean a person? That's just so ambiguous. And it gives the idea that Jesus can't wait to get into your life and fulfill your dreams. Instead of what the gospel is, that you deny yourself. It's the end of you. And you turn over everything to Him as the absolute sovereign of your life. In John 13, 13, Jesus said this, You call me Lord, and you're right, because I am. Jesus never offered himself as less than the absolute ruler of the lives of those who belong to him. And if he's the absolute ruler, then I need to know what his will is. And it's only found in one place. Simplifies for me the ministry. Now, that was part of the introduction. Turn to John 15. <laughs> John 15. I love this passage. Ha! Have you ever read verse 14? That's a shocker. John 15, 14. I just have two points now to make. Listen to this. You there, John 15, 14? Listen to this. 
You're my friends if you do what I command you. I have never had a friendship like that. Have you? Have you ever gone to somebody and said, I want to be your friend, and I will be your friend if you do everything I command you? What kind of a friendship is that? That's not a friendship. That's a dictatorship. So whatever this friendship we have with Jesus is, it is a whole lot different than any other friendships we have. You are my friends if you do everything I command you. What is that? And then in the next verse, he says, no longer do I call you slaves. Wow. So you're my friend if you're my slave, right? Yes, but you're not just slaves. I've called you friends too. For in all things I've learned from my father, heard from my father, I made known to you. I'll come back to that. I want to make two points and we'll go back to the text. Point one, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is head. Jesus is king. But I want to do it with a little bit of a very simple word study. What's the Greek word for Lord? Anybody know? Kurios. Kurios. Means one who has power, ownership, absolute right to command, and it's used 747 times in the New Testament. All over the place. It is synonymous with another word. Jude 4 will give you a good comparison of that. Jude, a little book tucked in the shadow of Revelation. Jude, verse 4, refers to our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. How many Masters and Lords do we have? Our only one, our only Master and Lord. The word Lord here is kurios. The word master, which is a synonym, listen to this one, is despotes. From which you get the English word despot, which in the vernacular refers to somebody who's completely, totally in charge. So you have the New Testament word despotes, which is used about four times. It's used in uh, Luke 2. It's used in... Acts 4, it's used in Revelation 6, and and it's used in Jude 4. And then 747 times you have the word kurios, which is Lord. They mean the same thing. He is Lord in the sense that he is despot. Both words are extremely powerful. By the way, only 92 times is Lord used in Acts, and two times the word Savior. He is our Savior. But far more times the message is, He is our Lord. To say Jesus is Lord is not simply to identify Him as deity. It is to acknowledge Him as absolute sovereign ruler. He is the despot over the life of His people and over His church. The church, all its pastors, all its leaders, all its elders, all its deacons, teachers, and people are no less than an assembly of those who by the power of the Holy Spirit have become those who confess Jesus as Lord. When I go to church, I don't need to be entertained. When I go to church, I don't want to hear some book review. When I go to church, I don't want to hear how clever you are. I want to know what my Lord asks of me. Jesus is Lord. I wrote a book on this years ago. The Gospel According to Jesus. I wrote it again recently. Tweaked it. Because I don't think people get it. It's the foundational reality. How in the world can Jesus as Lord be lost on the so-called church? You're not Lord. He's not the genie who jumps out of the bottle and does what you want. You can name it and claim it till you're purple. There's a corresponding word to kurios. Corresponding word in Greek literature. The corresponding word to kurios is doulos. You heard that word? Doulos, okay. Uh, this is a real sad thing to talk about. I'm going to talk about it anyway. In Luke 6, 46, Jesus said, Why do you call me Lord and don't do what I say? 
I think part of it for this generation is because we don't get it. We don't know what being, your being Lord means. And one of the reasons we don't is because we don't have the right translation of doulos. Now stick with me on this. You're going to find this amazing. Doulos only means one thing in Greek. Slave. That's all it means. That's all it's ever meant. It's not even debatable. It's not even to be discussed. Slave. There are six words in the Greek, at least, or seven for servant. Servant is completely different. A servant is someone who does something for someone. A slave is someone who is owned by someone. A servant is an employee. A slave is not. A slave is owned. That's doulos. Kurios and doulos go together. There's no such thing as somebody who's kurios who doesn't have doulos, douloi. And you're not a doulos unless you have a kurios. Nobody is the Lord of nobody, and nobody is the slave of nobody. And since it's established that Jesus is the kurios, we are the doulos. 130 well, 150 times total, if you add the uh, variant forms of it, 150 times in the New Testament, we are identified as doulos. Christ doulos, 1 Corinthians 7. We're doulos. We're slaves. What's a slave? Well, if you were living in Bible times, you wouldn't even have to ask the question. If you were living in New Testament times, it would mean you had been bought and owned. You had no legal rights. You had no will of your own. Um, you were owned by your master. You were provided for by your master. You were protected by your master. You were punished by your master. And you were rewarded by your master. But slavery is kind of offensive. Isn't it? We don't like it. But Kittle. Anybody know what Kittle is? Big Greek dictionary that gives you more than you ever wanted to know about every single Greek word. This is what Kittle says about doulos. The meaning is so unequivocal and self-contained that it is superfluous to give examples and trace its history. It means slave and it never has meant anything but slave. In your Bible, out of the 130 times, every time the word doulos appears in your Bible, and refers to a believer, it will be translated something other than slave. The only time the English Bibles translate slave, slave, is when you're talking about an actual slave or an inanimate thing like being a slave of sin. Every time, this is a survey done by Murray Harris on 20 English translations. 20 English translations of the New Testament. Only one of them translates doulos, slave, every time. And that's the E.J. Goodspeed translation, very obscure translation, done by a cutting-edge 1930s Greek scholar at the University of Chicago who was faithful to what he knew the word meant. I'm talking about whether you're talking about NAS, New King James, King James, ESV, you name it. And it started, believe it or not, in 1560 with the Geneva Bible. And they were afraid that there was too much stigma with the word slave. But doulos means slave and it doesn't mean anything but slave and that's all it means. And I think it's one of the saddest things about biblical translation that we've been cheated out of that. You will find this word very often. Servant. Or you will find a word doesn't exist in the Greek, bond servant. Which is some kind of an English concept in which a servant was attached to the land that they borrowed. But the word is slave. If you tell me Jesus is Lord and I'm his slave, then I understand what I'm supposed to do. Whatever my master tells me to do. If you tell me I'm an employee, then that puts me in a negotiating position. That's a huge difference. huge and then you don't know what it means in Matthew 6 24 when it says no man can serve two masters well of course they can most of you have a whole bunch of bosses you might even have two jobs but if you translate it right 
No man can be a slave to two people. Why? Because you can't be owned by two people. You have one owner, one master. This is what it means to follow Christ. That's why Jesus said, deny yourself, take up a cross, follow me, count the cost. You don't build a tower without counting the cost. You don't go to war without counting the cost. And the cost is you give up your own autonomy. It's over. You don't call the shots. I do. By the way, slaves were bought. And so were you. Not with silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. If you just put the slave metaphor back in the Bible, the whole thing makes sense. You were chosen. Slaves were chosen. You were bought. Slaves were bought. You were owned. You are owned. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. And your master provides all your needs according to his riches. And your master is the one who protects you so that nothing can ever separate you from his love. And your master is the one who disciplines your disobedience. And your master is the one who will reward you in the end when you hear, well done, by the way, good and faithful, do loss. It's not about a feel-good message, the gospel. It's about abandoning your life. If you follow this through the New Testament, I wish I had time to do this. Just whenever you find the word bondservant or servant anywhere in your New Testament, and it refers to believers, know it's the word doulos. Just put slave in there. Look at the book of Revelation, for example. Uh, It's a little frustrating not to be able to look at everything, but Revelation 1. I love this. The revelation of Jesus Christ, verse 1, which God gave to show to his what? What does your Bible say? Bond servants, servants. The book of Revelation, God gave to show to his slaves the things which must shortly come to pass. The book of Revelation was written for slaves of Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 7 begins to unfold the drama of the great tribulation. And verse 3 says, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the slaves of our God. We're slaves now, and the believers in the tribulation will be slaves then. This is not a temporary relationship. It's always going to be this way. They'll be slaves then. Chapter 10 of the book of Revelation. I'm just using Revelation as an illustration because we can't look at all the books. (laughs) Verse 7 of chapter 10 It says, in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he's about to sound, the mystery of God is finished as he preached to his, guess what? Slaves, the prophets. They were slaves in the past. We're slaves in the present. They'll be slaves in the future. Chapter 11, verse 8. Um, Well, chapter, let's go to chapter 19. We could get bogged down a little bit there. Chapter 19, I think it is, verse 2. Yes, his judgments are true and righteous. He has judged the great harlot corrupting the earth with her immorality, and he has avenged the blood of his slaves on her. Verse 5, the voice came from the throne saying, Give praise to our God, all you his slaves, you who fear him, small and great. Chapter 22, verse 3. Guess what, folks? When you get to heaven, you're going to be a slave. Yep, we're in heaven in chapter 22, aren't we? In the water of life, the throne of God and the Lamb. Verse 3, there will no longer be any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb will be there. And His slaves shall serve Him. Verse 6, He said to me, the words are faithful and true. And the Lord God... And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angel to show to his slaves the things which must shortly take place. The letters that are written in the New Testament by the writers of the epistles of the New Testament, Romans 1, Philippians 1, Titus 1, James 1, 2 Peter 1, Jude 1, 
all start out by identifying the author as a slave, a slave, a slave, a slave, a slave, a slave, a slave. Well, I can't emphasize enough. Do you understand this? Slaves were chosen. The master went into the marketplace and chose them. Scripture says we were chosen before the foundation of the world. Predestined. They were bought. Scripture says we were bought. Purchased with the blood of Christ. Slaves were then owned. You're not your own. We're owned. Slaves are subjects to their master. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Follow me. Slaves are dependent. All our needs are supplied by our master. Slaves are disciplined. Slaves are rewarded. The whole understanding of the elements of salvation unfolds if you understand the kurios doulos relationship. Now, I understand that that's an offensive message. People have a lot of memories about slavery. Let me help you with that. You're a, you're a Christian in the first century, okay? You're a, you're, you're a believer in the first century. So um, the apostles have trained you to go evangelize. Here's what they tell you to do. Go to the Jews and tell them that Jesus is their Messiah. Really? What are they going to say? Can't be our Messiah. He died. And the cross to the Jew, 1 Corinthians 1, is a stumbling block. Massive. You can't have the Messiah killed by Israel and the Romans. You can't have a Messiah who not only doesn't overthrow Rome, they execute him. You can't have a Messiah who is not recognized by the theological elite of his own nation. You can't have that. That's an absurdity. And then you can't have a crucified, cursed Messiah. Stumbling block. Oh, by the, by the way, tell him then this. That not only did he die, but he's God, and God killed him. That's right, isn't it? Wasn't Jesus God's sacrificial lamb? So tell the Jews that the Son of God died and God killed him. What? Thumbling block. And then when you get to the Gentiles, tell them that this crucified man is God. And the Gentiles will say, but one of the elements of deity is immortality. This is impossible, and they will, cause this, uh, they will call this foolishness. There's an etching in the Circus Maximus in Rome, seen a few times. It shows the picture of a crucified body of a man and the head of a jackass. And it shows a guy bowing down underneath. He's supposed to be a Christian, and it says, Alexa Menos worships his God, a crucified jackass. Just a stupid idea. So go to the Gentile world and tell them that a crucified man is the God of the universe. Oh, and then, by the way, tell them both this. That this God is demanding to be your master and for you to become his slave. And slavery is not a distant memory. It is a living reality. You think it's tough to preach the gospel today? You say, well, they, weren't in, they didn't understand how to do cultural adaptation. No, they didn't, but they also knew that the only way that somebody could get saved in that kind of circumstance with that kind of message was by the power of God, and they believed in it. You say, well, let's go back to John 15 for a minute. There, there's an end to this. Back to John 15. I love this. You're my friends if you do what I command you. This is a new kind of friendship for me. You know, not every slave was a friend with his master. Is that right? Not every slave was a friend with his master. There was a lot of abuse. Never will be any abuse with this master. Because this is a master who calls you his friends. I'll go one better. This is a master who calls you his sons. I'll tell you how good this master is. He blesses you with all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. I'll tell you who, how good this master is. He makes you a joint heir of all that he possesses. I'll tell you how wonderful this master is. He lets you sit on his throne and reign with him forever.
I'm his slave, but I just happen to be a slave who's also a friend. That was understood. There were relationships between slaves and masters that transcended the slave-master relationship, and they became friends. And you know what made them friends? This verse tells you, verse 15, I've called you friends. How is it that I went beyond being just a slave and became a friend for all things that I heard from my father I've made known to you? You know what makes a friendship when you have your master share everything in his heart with you. Then you transcend that relationship. Jesus is my Lord, but he's my friend because he's literally passed on to me through the writing of Scripture by the power of the Holy Spirit everything his Father wanted me to know. I am on the inside. Am I a slave? Yeah, but I know the mind of my Master. And he's revealed it to me. What a privilege. Most slaves were told what to do without an explanation. And I'm a friend because I know everything. And do you know why I know everything? Because he loves me. And he wants to share it with me. Just think about what an understanding of this truth would do to the prosperity gospel. (laughs) Think of what it does with the idea that Jesus wants to come along and make you rich. Or for that brand of faith that guarantees your best life now and you can make it any old way you want to make it. Jesus will jump on your bandwagon and be your number one cheerleader. These are all opposition to the concept of the Lordship of Christ. It's all about obedience. 1 John 2, 4. If you say you're Christ, it's just a sham unless you do what He commands, right? You say, ah, boy, I still am bothered by this slave concept. I don't, I don't like that idea. Let me help you with that. Turn to Philippians 2. You're about to feel some pain if you're still resisting this. <laughs> Verse 5, Philippians 2. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself taking the form of, guess what? A slave. Wow. All the way down to becoming obedient to what? The point of death. That's taking up your cross. You remember how many times he said, I only do what the Father shows me to do. I only do what the Father tells me to do. I only do what the Father wills for me to do. I only do what the Father asks me to do. He is the model of obedience. He found glory in being a slave. Slaves were burden bearers, weren't they? Remember Isaiah 53, 6? All our iniquities he laid on him. So when we talk about Christ being the head of the church, this is what we're talking about. We follow his lead. Now, some of you are saying, well, wait a minute, I thought I was a son. You, you are, but don't mix your metaphors. Don't, 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 don't turn this into an omelet. Each metaphor defines a certain aspect of spiritual life. Look at Luke 17. Just a few more scriptures that I'll throw at you here. You can follow this up and think it through for yourself. By the way, if you want a translation of the New Testament that has doulos translated slave everywhere exactly correctly, it is the Holman, New Holman translation, or there's a translation of the New Testament by J. Adams that's faithful to the text. Luke 17, 7, which of you having a slave plowing, and they'll, they'll translate slave when it means a physical slave, 
Which of you having a slave plowing or tending sheep will say to him when he has come in from the field, come immediately and sit down to eat? No. <laughs> will he not say to him, prepare something for me to eat and properly clothe yourself and serve me until I have eaten and drunk and afterward you will eat and drink? He doesn't thank the slave because he did the things which were commanded, does he? So you too, when you do all the things which are commanded, you say we are unworthy slaves. We have done only that which we ought to have done. That's it. At the end of the day, when you've done everything you ought to have done, you can only say, I'm an unworthy slave, and I've only done what I ought to have done. It's all about obedience. When you came to Christ, you were captured. And you were enslaved. But your master is a despot of love and mercy and grace who make you, makes you his friend and his son and his joint heir. And now, in connection with preach the word, listen. Non-biblical ministry, non-expository preaching, non-doctrinal teaching hinders Christ's headship and lordship. It interposes between Christ and His church. We have one simple task. We have the responsibility to disseminate to the slaves their master's will. And that means you bring them the mind of Christ through the word of Christ. Turn to Ephesians 1. And I'll, this will be the last scripture, although there's so much more to say about this. That's what the preacher always says when he's run out of material. <laughs> oh, we could go on and on, brother, and he hasn't got a thought or a note. <laughs> but I'm giving away all the secrets, right? That's not good. Okay, Ephesians 1. Just love this. Oh, this is such a great prayer. Starts in verse 15. Down at verse 17, pick it up. The God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory. Hey, he's praying. You know, I don't cease to pray for you that you might understand. You know, the verse 18, the eyes of your heart might be enlightened that you might know what is the hope of his calling and the riches of the glory of his inheritance. And say, I just want you to get it. I just want you to know what is yours in Christ, the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe and so forth and so on. This is in accordance with the working of his strength, his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead, seated him at right hand in heavenly places. Then this, this is where Christ is now seated, at God's right hand in the heavenlies, far above, huperano, huperano, ano is above, huper, hyper, far above, all rule, all rule, that's RK, firsts. Archangel means first in rank. RK, all firsts, all primacies, all authority, all exousia, meaning power or might. And the next word, power is dunamis. And then dominion, curiates, lordship. He is not only above all of those, he is far above all of those. And every name that is named, that means persons, because only persons have names. Not only in this age, but also in the one to come. So for all time, for all creation, Jesus Christ is far superior to all others of rank. Far above. Super high. Listen to this. And he put all things, not just all persons, but all things in subjection under his feet. I love this. And gave him as head over all things to the church. It doesn't say he gave him as head of the church. He gave, it says he gave him who is head over all things to the church. When God said, uh, I need somebody to lead the church. I need somebody to direct the church. He didn't pick Gabriel. He didn't pick Michael. 
He didn't pick 10,000 super angels to constitute a committee. He said, I know who I'll give to the church. I'll give to the church to be its head, the one who rules the universe. Folks, you can trust his rule. I just want to know what do you want me to do, Lord? What do you want me to say? I just want to understand your will and tell the people so we can do it. He didn't give us gifted preachers as the head of the church or gifted teachers or theologians or evangelists. He gave us the ruler of the universe. And so I say, fall on your faces, you popes. Fall on your faces, you kings and queens. Fall on your faces, you self-appointed proud lords of the church who lead it your way and not his. Humiliate yourself, you who deny Scripture its place in the church, for it is the voice of the head of the church. Take your place on the ground, all of you who put your cleverness, your creativity, and your will above the will of the Lord of the church. And be warned, that is a serious, serious crime. Back to John Huss. It is reported at his death, as I said, that he said this. You may silence the goose, but there will come a swan. Him you will not silence. He said that to the Bishop of Constance, who sentenced him to death. A hundred years later, here comes Martin Luther. And he is being ordained in a little church in Erfurt. I was there not long ago. Amazing experience. A little stone church. Luther was being ordained in the front of that little church. And in those days when they ordained a priest, they made him lie prostrate on the ground and spread their arms wide in the sign of a cross. They were flat on the ground with their arms spread. When Luther did that, He was lying on a crypt. You know, some of those old churches have people buried in them. He was lying on a crypt. He was lying on the crypt, the grave of the Bishop of Constance who condemned Huss a hundred years before. The swan had arrived on the grave of that bishop. Maybe... Maybe when Huss said, you may silence this goose, but a swan will come, him you will not silence. Maybe the bishop says, over my dead body. (laughs) Preach the word, my friend. Preach the word. Let the Lord of the church... Speak to his church. Father, thank you for the word. Thank you for the faithful through history. We just want to be in the line of the faithful. We just want to march with them. We just want to fill up our little spot in the ranks. We don't want the head of the church diminished in the church on our watch. Not during our time. Give us the strength of conviction and courage. The seal, if need be, the great truth of the headship of Christ over his church with our own blood, if that should ever come, as those who have come before us. We're so honored. We're so honored to be in the long line of godly men who exalt Christ. Be exalted in this generation through these faithful servants, we pray, for your glory. In the name of our beloved Savior, amen.